Hello, everyone. My name is Paula Neves, and I'm the lead for the Center for Living Organ Donation. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our regular webinar series. We're very, very pleased to have um, Dr. Marcus Salzner uh, join us today. And our topic is innovation, uh, specifically ex vivo organ perfusion. Um, Dr. Salzner is an associate professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. Uh, and he's also medical director of the UHN liver transplant program and co-director of the abdominal organ transplant fellowship. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marcus Selsner. Yeah, thank you, Paula, <clears throat> for this uh, very nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here today and uh, to talk about what we are doing uh, in organ transplantation to make better organs. And also it's a great chance to highlight, highlight a little bit our research and innovations which we are doing at UHN for liver transplantation. So, so my talk is um, focused on organ perfusion and I try to highlight a little bit what we are doing today to keep livers and kidneys alive outside the body um, and, uh, and what, are, what we're currently doing and how it may look like in the future. And I have to, of course, admit um, this is not about life donation uh, primarily. It's about disease donation, how we improve organs. But it indirectly, indirectly affects, of course, the life donation because we have to optimize everything we can do with disease, dona with disease donations to, to uh, also allow life donation to happen. So in this talk, I will talk about a bit about the logistics of organ transplantation. How does it actually work? How, does he, um, how do organs come from a donor to a recipient? Then we talk about how do we keep the organs alive during this time while they are neither in the donor nor in the recipient. We talk a bit about current preservation techniques. How do we preserve the organs? And then I will talk a bit about research and future technology and how it may look like in a few years uh, from now. So this is a slide for liver transplantation. It's true for any organ, I have to say, and has not changed uh, in the last decades. Um, it reflects patients waiting for a liver transplant and the amount of liver transplants we're doing. And by far, we have more patients listed and waiting for a transplant than actually we are doing transplants. And in liver transplantation, a quarter of patients actually will die on the waiting list without having a transplant because we have no available donor organ. So, so how does organ transplantation works uh, and what challenges we have to make it happen? Of course, donor hospitals are often quite far away from the receiving hospital. Um, and Canada is a big country. We, uh, we have to travel great distances uh, to bring donor organs to our transplant center. So we have a donor team that flies to the donor hospital. If it's close by, we might also um, drive by car, but often we need a, we need a jet to go there. Um, then we have a donor team that undertakes the donor surgery. The organ is extracted from uh, the donor. Then they have to go back to the airport and flying back to the Toronto airport uh, or um, to the other transplant centers, wherever it goes. Then they have to drive the car to the uh, hospital. Then we have to prepare the organs. The organs still need some um, work to be implanted. This can take an hour, an hour and a half. And then we have to implant the organ into uh, to the recipient. So as a consequence, of course, the, between taking the donor organ out and connecting it into the recipient, we have a time frame from four to 24 hours uh, where the organ, liver or kidney has no blood supply. This, of course, raises important questions. If the organ is out of either body, donor or recipient, how does it get blood supply? How does it get oxygen? What about nutrition? No one can hold his breath for, for that long. So what do we do to keep the organs alive outside the body and in this period? And what has been done traditionally mostly is cooling. We cool the organs down. And this is literally done. We are, we are flushing them, um, the blood out. We are uh, replacing the blood with a solution. We put them on ice. We pack them on ice um, and, uh, and put them in a kind of camping cooler uh, for transport. And uh, in the end, it's nothing different than putting food in the fridge. We're slowing down the dying process. If an organ is cold, it will still undergo changes that are unwanted, but you slow down these changes. And if you hurry up a lot, 
we are fast enough that the organ is still viable and can be used for time. But what we do is nothing else than slowing down the dying processes of the organ in between. So the principles of organ preservation at the moment is getting rid of the blood. Blood is not supposed to be in organs when they're cold. We're cooling them to four degrees Celsius, which is melting ice. So they're sitting literally in melting ice and we hurry up a lot. We, we try to not waste any time and we try to be very fast. So technically speaking, the donor surgeon will cannulate blood vessels in the donor. We flush out the blood and replace it with a cold preservation solution. The organ is then taken out. It's wrapped in several bags, um, sterile bags. And then we, we uh, take a, a plane. Unfortunately, the Canadian Army is not giving us the, uh, the, uh, the fast planes. The real plane is actually behind here. That's the plane. It just was, was a nice picture to take, but we're taking like a Learjet specifically rented uh, for this purpose. So we don't take commercial flights. We go directly uh, with the Learjet from Dona airport to the next recipient airport. And once we are there, we, we go to the OR as soon as possible, not to waste any time. And then we do the transplant as quickly as we can, can do it. So if you look for the history of organ uh, transplantation for liver and kidney, it started in the 60s with just cooling the organ down and then People realized really quickly this doesn't work alone. You have to also get rid of the blood. Then it was Collins who developed the Collins solution, a Eurocon solution, who washed out the blood and it was a sugar solution. It was a very poor quality. Organs were terribly damaged and it didn't really work very well. And it was in the 1986, I apologize for the misspelling here, 1986, where actually uh, in Wisconsin, uh, Belzer developed the University of Wisconsin solution, which has a more complex um, uh, ingredients and it was much better than everything before. So in 1986, organ preservation improved significantly and suddenly organs were viable for several hours out of the body. Um, and uh, this was the main breakthrough we had in organ transplantation. Then we had some other solutions coming um, in the 88 HGK solution, which is equivalent to University of Wisconsin solution. Not better, not worse, it's a second choice. And more recently, we have kidney cold perfusion, which moves the same fluid around that was static before. So what can we achieve? The heart is still short. The heart still has no long uh, toler tolerance to um, being on ice, four to six hours only. So basically, the moment the heart is retrieved, the recipient surgery has to start because four hours is just the time you need to fly from or go from Thunder Bay to Toronto. Lung is a bit better, eight or 12 hours. Liver, eight or 12 hours, plus minus, I would say, depending on the, um, on the type of liver you have. Pancreas, very similar, and kidney, eight to 16 hours. Occasionally, we can wait 20 hours. So there is heart and lung are the shortest, and for liver, kidney, pancreas, they have a little bit more time. So if you look at this organ preservation technique, cooling and removing blood, that was a great idea, uh, but it has not changed since 1986. So basically the last innovation we had in this field, which changed our clinical practice, the last step forward was in the mid eighties. And this is what quite depressing in, in some way because today is 2020. And when we think that things has changed since 1986, we have laptops. In 1986, we had only the very first computers, I would say. Then we have the internet developed. We have, we have cell phones, which we couldn't dream only about in 1986. And we have self-driving cars, electric cars, amazing new technology has evolved. But the way we do organ preservation, at least for kidney and liver, is still the ice box. So we just put things on ice like it was always done. Nothing has changed in this regard and, um, and innovation has bypassed um, um, this, uh, this technology. So why, why is that? Why did things not move along and why uh, are we not we making more progress in organ preservation? And there are several reasons. On one hand is for good organs, it is actually works quite well. If you, um, if you have a good organ from a young donor, uh, then cold storage has appealing att um, um, attributes. It's easy to perform. It doesn't meet, need any, any technology. You will just flush out the blood. It is low cost because you just have to have a line in the back of preservation solution. And for good grafts, it is very effective and it results in actually good outcome. But there are also downsides, as I highlighted before. If you put things in the cold without oxygen, 
we have ongoing organ damage. So the organ gets less well as the organ storage time goes along. We cannot assess any grafts. There's no graft um, testing or we have no information about the organ. An organ in icebox is like not, um, can be evaluated. We can't do any graft repair or changes. We, we cannot really um, improve the graft. And unfortunately, many donors we have are not the perfect healthy donors. We have many organs that are marginal or have some problems and cold storage is only tolerated poorly by marginal grafts or suboptimal grafts. So this is just a list of things that has been developed in the research labs over the last uh, 20 years. Just to tell you, we have not been lazy. We have done a lot of research, mostly in rodents, uh, also in pigs, uh, studying organ preservation. And there's a number of things that has been protective or effective. There are a long list of um, compounds that could be used to improve organ preservation, highly effective in rodent animals. But if you think what of these compounds has been used then in clinic, what have we brought to our patients? The answer is nothing, none. None of the compounds that was effective in animal models have been transferred to the clinic. None of them has been actually implemented and we have not actually improved cold storage. And the way we flush organs today and store them is exactly the same as I did it when I started my career many, uh, many years ago. So why is that? Why can we not bring things from the bench to the bedside? Why are our research innovations are not transformed to clinical trials? Why do our patients not benefiting from this research? And this has something to do with the way we do organ preservation. So once the organ donor is declared and is found, there's very little time for any intervention. There are many teams coming by. We have sick recipients, there are urgent recipients. So we cannot really now um, spend time on doing interventions or, or giving drugs because everyone wants to go and, and our recipients are in, in very bad need of this organ transplant. Then any drug giving to a donor will, will, inter will affect all organs. So if I have an amazing drug that protects my liver, I can barely answer the question, what will do to the lung, to the heart, to the pancreas, I don't know that. So it is a very unspecific application of, of any intervention and you would need to be sure that any organ system will benefit or at least not be harmed. Once the organs are cooled, the metabolism is slowed down and anything, any intervention that requires metabolism will likely not work because now the organs are ice and it's likely unresponsive to uh, any drug in, uh, intervention at least. And once we do the transplant and we bring blood, bring the blood back into the organ, graft injury is very fast. It recurs rapidly. Within minutes of transplantation, injury will manifest itself. And at this time, it's usually too late and we're unable to, uh, to uh, intervene. So if you if can make a wish list and say, okay, what should be the optimal preservation technique? What could I have if I have a wish? And of course, I want the organ preservation technique that allows me to store organs for a prolonged period of time without causing any damage. I don't want that my organ gets worse during the storage time. I want the organ at least to be the same or even maybe get better. I don't want any injury. I don't want to cause any injury. Our organ preservation should not harm the organ. And if I can, I would love to assess the organ during the uh, preservation time I would, it would be very important if we could test drive the organ outside the body before we implant this into our recipient. And the last point is we have so much knowledge about graft injury and repair mechanisms, which we currently cannot apply. We would really love to have an organ preservation technique that would allow us to bring all our knowledge to the clinical site and repair and improve grafts during the um, storage time. So this brings us to, to now the changes. Okay, we, 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 I think it's quite obvious that the cold storage is good for some grafts, but not for a large part of other grafts. And we should do something different. Keeping things on ice in a, in a camping cooler um, is not the answer of our quest. And there has to be something better. And this has been changed in the last, I would say 10 years. New things have coming up. And um, I will highlight now a little bit for the liver. Um, and also uh, for the kidney, what are these new things and, and how could it look like in the future? And I will focus a bit on the hypothermic perfusion and the normal thermic, which is a warm perfusion. When I say normal thermic, I mean 37 degrees. That's what the human body 
would, uh, would like to, to, to have. So this is now called a liver perfusion. This is um, a group which has been very active in this field in Switzerland and the second group also in the Netherlands in Groningen. And they added oxygen to cold perfusion. The device is a liver device. It pumps uh, not blood, it pumps a preservation solution around, but they added oxygen to it, thinking that although the liver is cold and the metabolism is slow, it may be still be able to, um, to use uh, oxygen and make a bit energy and, uh, and maybe the level of low level of metabolism in the cold could be still supported. So they have the liver in a kind of cooling bucket here. They cannulate uh, the blood vessels. This is a portal vein, this is an artery, the bile duct, and the flush um, solution around that, that contains oxygen, but no erythrocytes, no, no blood components. And in this study, they, uh, they transplanted um, actually um, six livers um, with this perfusion. They call it HOPE, the hyperthermic, like cold oxygenated machine perfusion. So HOPE is a very nice um, abbreviation for this. We compared it with, two, with 12 livers that had the uh, classical preservation technique, but in being an icebox. And they look for different markers. ALT is a marker of injury. INA is a marker of um, clotting factors. It's a marker of function. And bilirubin is also a marker of function. For all three markers, the lower, the better. The less you have, the better the liver looks like. Blue is the perfusion um, storage, and black is the classical camping cooler kind of storage. And it showed that actually for all three markers, the perfusion was better. They had less ALT. That means there was less injury in these livers after transplantation. The coagulation was better, the, the patient had better clotting factors, which was better, and the bilirubin, which is the yellow uh, uh, blood uh, component, was lower, much lower, if the uh, livers were cold perfused with oxygen, then they, and then they were just in the, the icebox. So this was an interesting study that just giving oxygen and pumping things around made actually significant difference and, um, and may have improved already the way the organs um, are, are preserved. So this is now a, um, a second study with the same technique. They, they have the hope perfusion, which is the oxygen cold perfusion in, uh, in blue. And then they have a black and in red uh, control groups, which have been uh, stored with uh, cold storage. The blue line and the red line are the two ones you have to compare. These are similar types of organs. And these are the comparison uh, you need to look. And this is uh, graft survival. This is how long the graft, the liver functioned uh, after uh, transplantation. And it starts with 100%. This is, of course, at, at time zero when all the graphs are working. And then it's a five year uh, follow up. And you see that the livers that were originally perfused before transplantation with oxygen, cold in blue, were, had a much longer life than uh, the ones who were only uh, kept in a camping cooler. So even five years after transplantation, the uh, level of survival of livers with cold perfusion was much higher than those here with static cold storage, indicating there seems to be a long lasting benefit, even that it goes down for years and years after transplantation, which all goes back to the time the organs were retrieved and how they were stored between donor retrieval and, um, and liver transplantation. Uh, but now I want to switch gears. Now we want to talk about warm perfusion. This is a pig liver, and this is some of our research we do. We have livers which we perfuse warm, and you can see the difference right away. The liver is outside the body, but it's pink and uh, pink and healthy. That's a perfect color for a liver. We have blood in the system. We have um, uh, erythrocytes in the system. We give oxygen, we give nutrition, um, and we warm the liver. The liver is 37 degrees. So we pretend that the liver is still in the body. We, we try to fool the liver in thinking that it's still in the body when it's not. Um, so we give everything the liver needs. We, we imitate the heart by having a pump. We imitate the lung by giving oxygen. We imitate the bowel by giving nutrition. And, uh, and we try to have a system the liver works outside the body as it would work inside the body. So the liver is not an easy organ to perfuse. It has a very high oxygen demand. The liver is very metabolic active. It's like a factory in our body and it needs a lot of oxygen. Um, it's also quite heavy. It's about one to two kilograms heavy. So you can't put it on a flat surface. You will have um, like a compression of the lower part um, from the upper part. So the weight of the liver itself would be a problem if it's on a flat surface. 
that's why in the picture before we had it actually swimming in the water bath. You see it's in the water um, system here. And the liver has a complex blood supply. It has actually two blood vessels that goes in, uh, which both have to be um, um, perfused with different pressure and flow um, uh, criteria. So, we, so in Toronto, for a research lab, we created a perfusion system just for this purpose. Um, it's a circuit. And we have a pump that is our heart. It pumps the blood into an oxygenator that is, is like the lung. It gives oxygen. Then we have a filter in here. And then it goes to here. And then we have two inflows. This is into the artery. And then it goes uh, in, a, in a reservoir. And then it goes into the portal vein. We have two different inflows into the liver, which needs different pressures. And then we collect the blood from the outflow. It goes back in the reservoir and back into the circuit. In addition, we have a dialyze filter in between, uh, which, which we can actually dialyze the, the system and keep the, um, the composition of the, um, of the uh, system very stable. And, um, and it's like a kidney in between. So the liver gets support from an artificial kidney to keep the system very stable. And this system, I would say, hopefully we try to, to make the liver think it's in the body and it should work like it's in the body. So we can, first of all, keep it healthy as it would be in the body, but also analyze its function. We, if the liver is working, we can test how much clotting factor does it produce, how much bile does it make, so we can basically investigate uh, the function of the liver. And this is, again, animal experiment. So um, just to tell you a bit how it looks like, this liver, we on purposefully injured both liver the same way. Both livers had, in a pig model, an injury in, in, inflicted but this liver was called stored and then reperfused. And this liver was warm, warm perfused, stored, and then reperfused with blood. And you see this liver looks terrible. It's dark, it's patchy. That's a liver you would never transplant. It's very poor quality. This liver looks like a dream. It's wonderful, pink, happy, healthy. This liver looks absolutely normal. So this is a already from the appearance, a striking difference how organ function or how organ appearance can, can change the way you preserve it, a gentle preservation versus a cold anoxic preservation in an icebox. This is now uh, also in pigs in angiography. Uh, so we perfuse uh, the liver vessels with a contrast um, agent. And this is a warm perfused liver um, after, after uh, storage. And it looks like a tree in the summer. You see the blood vessels are open until the very end. It's like a tree with leaves. Uh, the whole tree is visible until the very, very end uh, of the uh, periphery. And if you have the same injury, but you store the liver cold, it looks like a tree in, this, in the winter. Suddenly you have main branches, but you're lacking the little leaves that comes off. So what happens is in the warm perfused liver, the whole liver is perfused until the very, very end. But in the cold sort liver, we have a lot of blood supply in the middle. But we're losing the periphery. We're losing actually the edges of the liver. And this results in this patchy kind of appearance, which, uh, which I showed you just a few slides before. This is a cast. So in the end of this experiment, we inject a uh, plastic into the um, uh, organs, we uh, red plastic into the um, vessels, green into the bile duct. And you should have both. And this liver is one perfuse. It has both. You see is again the appearance of a tree in the summer. We have very nicely um, um, opened bile ducts and arteries until the very end. Um, the whole liver is very nicely uh, seen. And this is a cold stored liver. And you see again, we have this centralized appearance, but nothing goes off. And even green, the bile duct stop. While here the bile duct is until the very end, there is nothing coming off. It's like branches ending in, in, uh, in nowhere. And you could easily imagine that this liver would not function if it was used. This liver, in contrast, looks actually very nice. So this was a study done by Peter Friend's group in Oxford. And Peter Friend is a pioneer in this field. Actually, he is the one who started it uh, um, first, I have to say. This is also an animal experiment in pigs uh, where he had two livers. Um, one was a cold stored for 24 hours, and one was warm perfused for 24 hours. And then he transplanted this uh, liver into a recipient pig. And you see that actually in, those, in the cold stored group, uh, animals died, um, a good portion died, but nearly all animals survived into the warm perfused group, indicating there is actually survival benefit. Graphs that wouldn't work, cold stored actually do work if it's warm perfused, and we can actually have some important valuable changes in these organs, but we can make them better 
we can make them work and, and sustain life. This is another um, pig experiment from our group, which is after transplantation, cold stored livers looks darkish and purple. This liver looks very happy. You see this pill color and it makes bile. Bile is coming out after transplantation in the pig and it looks, uh, looks, looks very nice. So this is an extreme example because we like to, of course, get more um, livers and we did an experiment. We had two hours of no blood flow in, in the pig. This is a liver and it looks black. After two hours, no flow, we put it on the pump for three hours and the liver completely recovers and, uh, and, uh, and entirely uh, looks normal. And the liver was transplanted into a sleeping pig and looks perfectly healthy and, uh, and well. So we can actually uh, revive uh, organs that that looks that um, or looks unusable and the um, amount of recovery actually is astonishing. So in um, fortunately in the liver field now there have been clinical trials there have been companies who are making machines to perfuse livers for patients. Uh, it's um, done mostly in clinical trials at the moment but it's commercially available machines. Um, Organox is from England, Transmedics is from US, from Boston, and Liver Assist is from Groningen, Netherlands. So these are like startup companies uh, that uh, usually came from researchers and, and they're trying now to, to bring it to clinical practice to make sure our patients can benefit from this exciting technology. And this is something we do in Toronto also. This is the Organox machine. And you can, um, you can see our fellows working here on the human liver now before implantation. So this is now done for, for clinical practice for human transplant. There's a perfusionist watching the machine parameters and our, our team is connecting all the things. This is how the liver looks like when it's on pump. Um, so it's a liver out of the body now perfused. You see that the arterial line has a brighter color than the venous line indicating oxygen supply. Um, our team likes to pose afterwards uh, for successful uh, cannulation. Um, you see the machine in the background is perfusing the blood around. Here's a reservoir. It goes into a, in a circle and the liver is in this box over there. Um, this is again, the liver is on pump in this box um, um, and the machine can be covered actually afterwards. We bought actually a van to transport this machine. The machine is, is actually transportable, not in planes, but it can be put in cars. So we have an extra car for this. The machine weighs about 100 kilograms. So it's a uh, and needs, needs energy supply. So we bought a card that gives all the required um, uh, plugins. And then we're rolling it around. And this is a machine, how it's covered up. That's me at two in the morning, rolling it to the operating room, uh, coming from a different hospital and, um, and, uh, and getting ready for a transplantation. So this is again, our perfusionist, again, having this liver, um, setting it up. And then here it's, it's on, on pump. So, and the Peter Frins group is actually the one who did the world first uh, transplant. Um, he's, the, he's the one who actually uh, pioneered the field. In 2013 was the very first uh, liver transplant done with warm perfusion as preservation technique. And since then there has been a number of, of trials in Europe, uh, in, in, um, in um, US, also in Canada. I don't want to show you many data, but this is from our group here. Um, human transplantation of the warm perfusion in, um, in the dotted line and the cold storage in the um, solid line. Again, ALT is a mark of injury. The less, the better. And uh, you see that the ALT is a third in the warm perfused group than in the cold store group early after transplantation. So we were able to largely decrease actually the amount of injury inflict to this organ if you avoid cold storage and we do warm perfusion um, instead. And this is true also in human trials and it completely uh, images our experience in the from the animal research. So now I'd like to switch a bit gear to uh, to kidneys. <clears throat> uh, kidney is in many ways very parallel to to the liver. The way we store kidneys for many years is just on ice, and even today, in North America, half the kidneys are are, um, are put in the camping cooler. The other half is put in this device, which is a with a, it's a cold perfusion device. And I will also talk with warm perfusion afterwards a little bit. Um, so, so there was a significant change from the camping cooler to cold perfusion in the, in the mid 2000s, I would say. Um, this machine is a live port. It pumps fluid around. It does not give oxygen. It's only a moving fluid. 
So the only difference to camping cooler is the fluid moves, but there's no nothing, no other ingredient, no oxygen. It just changed from static to flowing. And this already had an improved outcome. This is now a human trial um, in New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and um, and the this is outcome of graft survival. The dotted line is the perfused one. The um, the uh, no the the uh, solid line is perfused. The dotted line is the cold stored camping cooler technique. This is how many graphs are alive um, over time. You see that actually, if it's just perfused, much more kidneys are, are alive over time. Um, and if you just keep it a camping cooler, you lose kidneys just because of that. And that's already amazing that organs like fluid that moves and they don't like fluid that stands around. This is now warm perfusion in, um, in the kidney. That's our research setup. Unfortunately, the, um, the um, kidney perfusion technology has not been picked up by industry and we have no, no uh, commercial available machines around. So this is a machine we built ourselves basically and it's uh, like a hot lung machine that can pump and you can see this is done by, of course, a couple of research people um, just putting tubing together, have monitors and some pumps. Uh, it's not pretty, but it gets the job done. And this is now how it looks like in the kidney. It's very similar to the um, to the liver. We have one inflow, one outflow, an artery and vein, and here's a ureter who uh, who um, produces urine. It's a, this is a pig experiment. The kidney looks really happy. It's a perfect color for a kidney, and it makes urine outside the body. So we can actually uh, perfuse the kidney. We can study its function, and we can collect urine uh, during the preservation time, even uh, before before we implant the kidney into a recipient. This is another kidney, very similar. We see urine is coming out from here, and this is we'll be putting it on a little sponge. It's research, so it's not human uh, transplantation. Uh, and again, our machine is terrible. It's, it looks very complicated, and it, and it really is. Uh, we did a study in, in pigs comparing cold storage with warm perfusion. So SCS means static cold storage, and NEBKP is an unfortunate abbreviation. It means warm perfusion. And this is a pig study where we transplanted the kidneys after six hours uh, storage. And in blue, it's only cold stored. In, uh, in, um, and in A is only cold stored in blue. In B is mostly cold stored with a very short pumping time afterwards. In C is half and half. We stored it half cold, maybe put it in pump for the rest. And in D is only warm perfused. So the kidney gets retrieved by the, and then we only keep it warm perfused and then we transplant this kidney afterwards. And this is creatinine, the, la the less the better. Creatinine you have probably heard from is, is a product the kidney is supposed to remove. So this creatinine in the blood of a recipient pig following transplantation, only having one kidney in its body that has been transplanted. And the higher the creatinine, the worse the kidney function is. And it turns out in blue dots is the one who has been cold stored the whole time, it's the highest. The square, the triangle is the one with a little bit of uh, warm perfusion. The orange is, is the one who has um, half and half. And the red one is only warm perfusion, no cold storage at all. These kidneys actually looked beautifully and, um, and had tremendous uh, benefit um, in its function in comparison to cold storage. And turn like out, the less you, cool, you store cold, the better it is. The more you're able to reduce cold storage, the, the, the better the kidney works after transplantation. This is a human trial from Hosgood and Nicholson in Leicester, also in England. They actually the first uh, warm perfused um, kidney transplantation. These were one donor and one donor gives two kidneys. Uh, one kidney was cold stored and this is this kidney and it didn't work. This is dialysis. Patient required dialysis post-transplantation for one, two, three, four, five, six times. And then finally it, it started working. And the second kidney from the same donor worked immediately and uh, they did not require any dialysis uh, following transplantation. So there was some indication also in humans it might actually be effective. The same group did a study where they compared 18 kidneys that were warm perfused in human transplantation with 47 that were cold stored. And the end point was delayed function of the kidney. So sometimes we need dialysis post transplantation for some time. It was a rare event in the warm perfuse group, only 5.6%. I mean, it was more frequent in the coastal group, 36%. Most of these kidneys will work eventually, but the, um, but the uh, immediate function of the kidney was much better if it's warm perfused. Uh, and all patients did basically well on the long run. 
So I'd like to, to conclude and also summarize a bit um, my talk by saying that hopefully I can convince you that organ storage is important for liver and kidneys, but for all organs actually. Um, the way we do it is cooling the organ on ice and it's still done as routine today. And this is how organs are stored um, very similar to the 1960s, uh, 1968, 86, uh, without any change in like um, 20, 30 years really. Very recently, we have new technologies coming up, cold and warm perfusion. Both are promising, both have good results. If you're not sure which one will be the, um, um, the end uh, winner in the end, uh, it's unclear at this point. There has been no direct comparison in humans at this point. Um, one certain um, benefit of warm perfusion is that function is maintained. So we can study the kidney and the liver better in warm because it will have a normal metabolism. In kidneys, we can collect urine. In livers, we can collect bile. And we can analyze the perfusion about what these organs produce. So there is advantage in assessment of these grafts and potentially also repair. If a kidney is warm perfused and it is um, metabolic active, the opportunities to repair kidneys or livers or help them make them better are much, are much greater. You need metabolism of the organ in order to do something about its uh, problems. So of course, all this, uh, yeah, the future hopefully is an organ repair center. The way I see it uh, 10 years from now is uh, we don't anymore get phone calls at night um, and decide on organ quality based on some data. Uh, in the moment, I get a phone call at two o'clock in the morning and I will decide if a liver or kidney is good or bad based on some information. In the future, hopefully we bring the organs to your center, we put them on the pump, we study them and we have some data and we can decide on organ quality based on results, on information obtained from these organs um, uh, while they are pumped and while they are um, perfused. Today, I would say we're here. This is a very first plane. And you just, this is for me, the way we have organ machine perfusion at the moment. It's like the very first airplane or the very first computer we, we developed. We always thought it's great technology, but of course, over time, um, it totally changes. And uh, we came a long way from air flight from to, to the uh, airspace. And uh, our machine perfusion technology we have at the moment is very clumsy. It is made by small companies, technically um, still in development, I would say. It is like a first generation computer, you can, you can say so. And I can only imagine uh, how this will develop once uh, technology evolves and we get smaller machines, better machines, smarter machines, um, who will be so much more slick and usable than what we have um, at the moment. Of course, it's all done by a group. All of the research I presented today wasn't done by myself, but our team. We have a lot of international people coming from all over the world to Toronto to join the lab and do the research. And um, and um, and uh, thank you so much for for your interest today. But also thank to our team who did all the work. That's all I have to say today. Thank you very much, Dr. Salzner. Uh, we are now we now have time for questions. Uh, we know a number of you have submitted uh, questions via Slido. Uh, if you are watching us on uh, YouTube Live, you may submit your questions by visiting slido.com and um, using the code XVIVO, E X V I V O. Um, and these are the questions received so far. We've got 14. You can upvote them if you'd like some questions to be addressed earlier. Um, and it looks like the two, we have two questions related to living donation, uh, Dr. Salzner. Uh, so the first is, um, is an ex vivo kidney just as good as a kidney from a living donor? No, it's not. The living donor kidney is in general a very high quality, very good kidney, which will have a very short preservation time because it's planned, it's done during the day, Donor and recipient surgery are done back to back. So um, it's like having a, um, a brand new car. You wouldn't bring that into a garage. The perfusion technology is done at the moment for kidneys or for organs that are not optimal. We try to make them better. We try to improve them. But the life on a kidney already starts with a pristine organ of highest quality and uh, function is generally excellent um, and there is nothing to, to gain. So live donor kidneys certainly is, um, you can't beat that in, um, in any direction. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and we have another question here. Is there any benefit uh, with respect to using perfusion on live donor kidneys? Not the way we use it at the moment. The moment we use perfusion as a preservation technique. And as I said, preservation is very short in live donor kidneys and the kidneys have very high quality. So there's no need to, to work on this, but in the future, we may have additional um, additional um, applications. Our research currently tries to um, is focused on changing kidneys. Maybe we can make them more, or maybe we can make them less immunogenic. Um, that you need less immunosuppression in the future, or we could uh, re change the blood type of the organ. So at this point, no. But our future research might lead to uh, indications down the road, where actually even live donor kidneys could benefit uh, in the in let's say ten years from now. Mm -hmm. And I think you may have addressed this during your presentation, uh, but it's a good reminder for everyone. Uh, how long is each organ viable uh, for transplantation? So each organ outside of the body. It's actually a great question. And it's, of mm -hmm. course, um, not the same, depending how old the organ, the donor was and um, from different variables. Uh, but usually, I would say for livers, I would um, get concerned if I'm more than 10, 12 hours out of the body. Um, for kidneys, uh, I would say uh, I try to be below 12 hours, but certainly up to 16 hours is still fine. Um, heart and lung have much shorter kind of um, preservation times. Mm -hmm. um, our next question is also a comment. Uh, the system looks quite involved. Uh, is it likely that uh, it could be eventually mini miniaturized? Uh, let's say the size of a cooler, um, so that it could be transported with a kidney to the recipient's location. Oh, absolutely. I mean, these are like first generation technologies. Now, we're looking at like a computer from the NASA in 1955 or so. So uh, if you ever visited uh, Cap Canaveral and you saw the computer they used for the initial rocket launches is laughable today. And I'm sure in 10 years from now, we're looking back and we have much better perfusion machines, smaller, uh, self-regulated. Um, so, so this is uh, technology which is completely changing over time. And for the kidney, we don't even have anything. For the liver, we have some prototypes from companies. It's, at least it's professionally designed and customized user-friendly to some degree. Our liver machine is still 100 kilograms, so that certainly couldn't be lighter. But for the kidney, I'll show you the picture. We have a self-made device. It's terrible. I mean, the kidney device is something we, we uh, we plug together ourselves, and it's um, totally user unfriendly and it's an expert user who is completely involved in this technology. So this will totally change over the next 10 years. And I'm 100% uh, convinced we will have something incredibly better in 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. So definitely an opportunity for manufacturing innovation for all those uh, <laughs> innovators out there. <laughs> I'm still waiting for Amazon, Google or so to join uh, and make a machine, I think, uh, or Tesla. At this point, it's small companies, and uh, but none of the major companies has actually engaged in producing machines. Right. Um, our next question relates to uh, advantages of ex vivo over options where you can keep the organs perfusing inside the body. So I didn't talk to about normal thermic regional perfusion today, NRP. This is another innovation which is very interesting. So uh, in, uh, in the no regional perfusion, you, perf you, you perfuse the, body, the organs in the body after death. So um, once the heart has stopped, you keep the organs perfused for two hours, which uh, is a good technique, very promising to resuscitate organs that has been um, damaged with some, uh, with some ischemia. Um, usually done for two hours and it's like a testing the organ, recovering the organ. The warm perfusion is different because we can actually keep the organ alive for a long time. So the, on the machine, I keep the organ for 10, 20 hours. So I can perfuse for next day. And so I can give a long time stretch where I can observe the organ, study the organ. I can plan the surgery. Uh, while the regional perfusion is done in the donor itself for two hours for a short time as initial assessment or repair. Both techniques can be compared, uh, com combined. Of course, the future I see is that we would do a donor perfusion in the donor for two hours to recover the organ, and then we put it on the pump for 12 hours to study it. So they're not competing, I believe. I think they are uh, complementary, 
and eventually both techniques will actually be uh, combined in the same retrieval um, uh, technique. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, this next, next question is, uh, is important. Uh, wh what do you see as the most crucial problem with this new technology? So it's different for liver and kidney. Liver is more advanced. The machines are, are more um, user friendly. So in, in the liver field, I would say the key problem is that the organs, the machines are not well portable. We, the, the, they can be transported, but it's very cumbersome. The machines are too heavy and the cannulation takes so much time to bring it to a donor hospital. So I need a machine that is more user friendly, more easy to use and lighter to transport and has more battery power. So technology advancement would be really, really good. The second problem for the liver is that uh, we don't have really um, assessment parameters that guides us in saying yes or no to the organ. We have hints, we have, we have uh, parameters that are helpful, but we don't have a score that can say, okay, if you're above five, we take it. If it's below five, we decline it. So we have not figured out um, uh, what is the, the ultimate technique to evaluate organs. For kidney, it's, the, the problem is very different because the technology is not there yet. There's no company has made a machine yet. We have only self-made machines, which are very troublesome for the kidney. The biggest problem is I need a company to make a machine that is user-friendly, that is easy to use, transportable, that can be pushed around at least in the same hospital. Uh, thank you. The next question is uh, more technical in nature. What is the preservation solution used during worm perfusion? So it's very different. Worm perfusion, you have to imitate basically mm -hmm. blood. You don't want to use blood because blood has also uh, unwanted components, a component that would be inflammatory or would spot inflammation. But you, would, you want to use something from the blood that is good, but has nothing of the bad. So what we use is washed blood cells, erythrocytes, from the blood bank. We give albumin, we give some, some sugar, um, we give nutrition. So the um, warm perfusion system is, uh, is an imitation of blood, uh, but trying to avoid anything that is unwanted. In the cold, you're using preservation solutions. You use basically uh, solutions from University of Wisconsin solutions, which are pumped around. There's no blood in there. There's, um, and, and it's basically only moving moving cold fluid and the oxygen amount is very little because it's only oxygen that is solved in uh, in the fluid while in the warm the erythrocytes can pack a lot of uh, oxygen and bring much more to the liver so the cold system needs less but also gets less the warm system is more complex it needs more and it gets more and it needs more maintenance Thank you. Um, the next question is uh, regarding the innovation uh, that you've developed. So what's unique about the system you've designed compared to others who've designed organ perfusion systems? So actually, um, the system we designed was for research and um, it's very similar to the system that has been designed for human, human perfusion. So I would say the hardware is not uh, is not unique. What we did, we added a dialysis filter in our system uh, to support longer perfusions. But my research and our group was mostly focused on the fluid um, of the fluid, not so much on the hardware. So we are studying mostly the the software. You can say how much, what kind of fluid does it need, what additives does it need, how can we change cells by giving drugs during the system. So um, the system used in the lab is very close. Remembers, resembles the Organox perfusion system, except we added dialysis uh, or a dialysis option to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I see we have uh, um, a, a question here that um, has been voted up. Um, it sounds like the biggest barrier to advancing this technology is attracting the right manufacturer. Uh, how do you plan to get that started? Uh, and I think uh, it's fair to say that everybody wants a Tesla. <laughs> yeah. so that's a good question. And the problem is transplant is still a small market for big companies. So mm -hmm. I talked to, because the machines in the end of the day are variations of hard lung machines. So the machines for perfusion, any machine for perfusion has a pump, has an oxygenator, has a heater and a warmer, and all these components are in hard lung machines. And what we need is basically a, a simplified hard lung machine that is smaller and more usable. And there are companies who are making hard lung machines like baking bread. 
there are huge companies who are multi-billion dollar companies and they can pump out hard lung machines all the time. And I talked to one of them actually, and I tried to convince them to make me a kidney perfusion machine. And the answer is the market is too small. They're making money in um, making hard lung machines with, um, with, um, for cardiac surgery. So I was un unable to make the business case for them. Um, and um, I, I think if we show more success, if we, if we are, if we can bring it to the clinical trials with our self-made machine, if we show the principle and we show how much good it will do and how much patient will benefit and how much quality of life will increase, I hope that the companies will, uh, will pick it up and, uh, and join. Uh, because it's not all about money, it's, it's also making uh, technology a reality, uh, but we need partners who have, who have the, the know-how. I'm a, I'm a surgeon, I'm not an engineer, I can't build a machine. I need, mm -hmm. I need someone who knows about machines and has also the financial background to bring this to the market. We should not forget that the hurdles are enormous. Uh, so the, um, the, um, the uh, licensing problems, it's not easy to make a machine for medical use ap approved in US or Canada. It's a multi-million dollar enterprise to take the studies. So companies shying away if the outcome is not certain. Mm -hmm. So uh, calling all uh, innovative, innovative companies out there interested in, in this project. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Uh, do you see the future being hypothermic or normothermic and why? I think you may have answered that question as well, but it's, uh, it's an important uh, question, I guess, for all of us. So at the moment, there are research groups who are heavily invested in hypothermic perfusion. Others are normothermic. The hypothermic perfusion is easier, is cheaper and safer. If the machine breaks down, and the pump stops, the liver or the kidney is still cold. Then you have it just, you always had it. Then you have the same preservation like before. If the normal thermic machine breaks down, the organ is lost. You cannot keep uh, any liver or kidney warm without flow for more than a few minutes. But the warm perfusion also gives you more. You have uh, no cold storage, you give oxygen, and you can test the organ, you get function parameters, and you get also much more opportunities to change and modify the organ. So, so uh, actually, I see the future in a combination of those. I believe likely we will transport organs cold, perfused with oxygen, which can be done easier in a smaller machine, less energy involved. And then when we come to the recipient center, we will flip it over to a warm perfusion device. And then we keep it alive overnight and study it and do something. So I think the future is actually the combination of both. Transporting warm perfusion is tricky. Transporting cold perfusion is much easier, and and we have to take both the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Our next question uh, invites a comparison. Of, so please compare the ex vivo perfusion durations in test and practice for the organs treated with this process. What are the top limitations for this duration for each organ? So no one has really um, tested carefully how long we can perfuse organs. The longest perfusions, at least in clinical use, were about 24 hours. Uh, no one has done it for longer at this point, um, but it could likely could. The key is, of course, you have a closed system. You, so you don't exchange the fluid. So it's like a cell culture dish, which you don't, where you don't change the, the nutrition. At some point, the machine will run out of supplies in nutrition and you will and you will accumulate um, things the liver makes and which is unwanted. Um, so but in theory, if you would exchange the fluid, you probably could go longer. At the moment, there's no need to go longer because um, usually the testing phase of your organ warm takes six to eight hours. Uh, even if you want to pl plan your transplant carefully, you really need more than 12 to 15 hours perfusion time. So, so I would say, um, um, if you want to perfuse longer, we probably have to understand hormone supplies better. We have to exchange the fluid at certain times. Um, but at this time, at least at this time in point in our research, um, there's no need. There is, I would say, once we try to make gene transfers and significant modifications of the graft, then maybe a longer perfusion might be uh, important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next question is really about the future or the near future, because five years um, seems like a long time, but it's not really. So what do you envisage um, happening uh, in liver transplantation and in this area in five years time? 
So I will I envision that machine perfusion becomes routine for all liver transportation with graft that are not perfect to begin with. I think in five years from now, we'll perfuse uh, not all livers, but a big portion of our livers. Um, and it will be the routine um, way we, we, um, we use it. So it's this, as technology evolves, it becomes easier and cheaper. This, this uh, technology also will be more broadly uh, used. And, um, and I see uh, the future that we look back and we shake our heads and we put livers in camping coolers. We can't believe that was what we did in the 2020s or so. I think this will go away and, and it will be, it, it's better. And this is the way we do it down the road. Mm -hmm. Our next question uh, relates to work already done. Which part of the system was the most difficult to create during your process? So in my view, it's not the hardware. You know, it's a, mis it's a misconception to think that you put a pump in the oxygenator with a tubing together, and this would be um, this would be a perfusion system that works. Um, I think the uh, the hardware is only a portion of the problem. The bigger problem is for me the fluid and the uh, way we perfuse the organ. The kidney and the liver are not stupid. They will figure out we're not in the body. What I get here is not actually the right fluid and there's even some plastic involved. So tricking the organ in thinking it's in the body um, requires a very detailed understanding what, how the fluid has to be created, how the flow has to be done uh, what temperature it needs. Um, so the um, it's not a it's not a physics exercise. It's a biology exercise. It's a it's a hybrid cyborg if you want so. And if you if you get the mechanics right, but you get the biology wrong, it will not work. You have to understand um, the um, what well, how do organs perceive normality, and this can be in great detail. And you might get um, nineteen ingredients right but you get the 20th wrong and the whole system is, is done. So you have to have a system that is from A to Z correct and in a, in a way the organs likes it and the way they think it's, uh, it's biology correct. So it's, it's a misunderstanding that it's, it's not about tubing and pumps, it's about biology and, uh, and physiology. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, we're coming up to the end of our webinar and we've got two questions left. Uh, this one is uh, regarding uh, ex vivo perfusion of other organs. Uh, can you talk a little bit about this um, uh, as, uh, the, and the research that's being done in this area as well? So there's a lot of lung perfusion has been well established and our group in Toronto has actually been leading in this field worldwide with uh, Dr. Gashafshi and Marcelo Seipel. They started this actually before the liver perfusion even started and they have it outside trials now in routine use. So lungs are perfused routinely um, uh, in Toronto and many other countries of the world with great success. The heart is done within trials. So there is some heart perfusion, um, but it's maybe not as established as the liver. It's something which is used in clinical practice, but, um, but only a few studies have been done and the value of the heart is less clear at this point. There's no pancreas perfusion at this point. Uh, Dr. Reichman from Toronto, from UHN, is actually probably the world leader in this field. And he actually has an animal model studying pancreas perfusion um, in animals, in pigs. And he is actually now working out the biology of this. Uh, as I said, the tubing and the pump is, is not the problem. He tries to now investigate um, what does a pancreas wants in order to be happy and healthy outside the body. This is like five years of research before you know that, and then you can do this. Um, and, and there's nothing done in small bowel or other organs in this regard. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Uh, we were, UHN was a leader in, in this area. <laughs> um, will we ever move to a bloodless solution for liver uh, perfusion? Yeah, maybe. So you need oxygen carriers. You need something that, that transports oxygen, but there are also artificial oxygen carriers and they have been used in studies. So these are not red cells, which we have from blood bank. There are hemoglobin conglomerates that can also carry oxygen, um, but are not necessarily in any cell type. So the advantage is you can buy this from the shelf. You can order this and you don't have to have blood donors. So potentially, yes. Uh, it's not clear if it's as good as blood cells at this point, but people are working on this with some success. And I could see that in five to 10 years, we may not need any more blood cells, but we can order 
an imitator, imitation of blood uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we've reached the end of our session. Uh, I would uh, like to thank Dr. Salzner for joining us, for sharing his expertise. I would like to thank our audience on YouTube Live uh, for joining us. And I would also like to invite you to join us next month uh, when uh, we have another webinar and we will be uh, uh, looking at uh, the um, uh, nutrition of uh, living donors and recipients uh, pre and post uh, liver transplant. So thank you very much everybody for joining us um, and uh, we will see you next month.